live from Liverpool, the Dark Paranormal, season 15. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dark Paranormal, season 15, episode 2. Now, I know what you're all thinking, where was this week's mini-sode? Now, sadly, this has become a theme for the last few seasons, and hopefully one that won't continue, but we did have the individual who submitted the mini-sode ask us to not air it at the last minute. Now, I would never air something that somebody has specifically asked me not to, However, you must appreciate from my perspective, and for you, the listener, it's exceptionally frustrating when you are telling people to tune in for a certain date, and that date never arrives. So please be mindful, if you are going to submit a submission, that you are okay with that being aired. That you have the permission of the people involved to air that submission. And I totally appreciate there are times you may type something out, you may send it in and then share it with someone and they inform you they're not happy with that going out. And that's exactly what happened this week. And I appreciate that at times that cannot be helped. However, it does mean our listeners do not have a minisode. I've spent time recording a minisode for no reason. And people, more importantly, don't get to hear what was actually an amazing experience. So please just do bear that in mind if you are going to submit an experience. Now, of course, you can submit an experience at any point. We're always open for experiences. And the email address is contact at the darkparanormal.com. If you're looking to have your experience read on the main show, please make sure it's around 3,500 words in length or around six sides of A4 paper. And to reiterate, that six single sides of A4 on, for example, a Word document. But if your experience is shorter than that, please still send it in, because we want to collate as many experiences as possible. And your experience may well find itself either on a minisode, or over on our Patreon show, Dark Bites where we take a look at some of the shorter experiences that didn't quite make the main show due to length. We have one saying on Dark Bites, and it's quite simply, the length of your paranormal experience should be in no way indicative of how terrifying or how truthful your experience was. And indeed, some of those shorter experiences have been the ones that have stuck in my mind for weeks, maybe months on end. Today's experience is a very interesting one, because for me, it's one which seems to rise as we go through the narrative. And like some of the best experiences we've covered, there appears to be almost, say, 70% of a backstory that's missing from this experience that we will never know. For me personally, these are my favourite type of experiences because it allows you to leave the podcast and go away and think about what that backstory may be. But before we get into today's episode 2, we've just spoke about our Patreon and of course we need to thank our newest members over on Patreon. When you join our Patreon, not only will you receive every episode that we release before everyone else and ad-free, but you can also gain access to the Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites. Dark Bites is released each and every Sunday of the year without fail, even on the downtime between seasons, meaning you never miss your paranormal fix. But the best thing about Patreon, truly, is the community. We've built a wonderful community of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts over on Patreon. And we'd love to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. Simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. Just like the following wonderful new team members have. 
Victoria Morris, Charlie Lynn Crowell, T. Price, Dawn Marr, Lauren Hampson, Tavia Dillon, Darren Tapley, Andy Truitt, Ben Simpson, Pamela, Annabelle, Mary Jane Cotone, Kim Wolfe, Mike, Brantley Drap, Mary P. Sloan, Minnie, Chelsea Rapp, Lee, Gabby Eschbach, Angela R., Tina Claycomb, Taylor White, Tracy Slews, Christine Spoviero, Maddie McGee, Lindsay Irish, Mim Allen, Will Palmer, Sean Gwynn and Curran Hunter. Thank you so much, guys. Your support truly means the world. And if you haven't heard your name yet, do not worry. After we have a season break, there's always a slight backlog. But your name will be called on one of the future episodes. So if early ad-free releases and, of course, over 60 hours worth of Patreon-only content sounds like the thing for you, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. But right now, it's time to lower those lights. Make yourself comfortable, and most importantly, leave your disbelief at the door, as we hear about someone crying wolf. My friends call me Pixie. I'm born and raised in New York, USA. Not the city. I'm upstate in the Adirondack Mountains. I've had paranormal experiences my whole life. My first memory is talking to spirits. I grew up an only child, so no one really questioned me talking to no one. I just had a very active imagination. But my tale starts when I was 15. I was a sophomore in high school. The goth girl. The badass. I befriended this girl... We'll call her Chrissy for this tale. She and I clicked because we were both practicing pagans in a very Catholic area. We're talking the early 90s here. The movie The Craft had just come out, so witchy things were very popular at the time. It wasn't easy finding friends who were actually pagan and not playing or pretending or taking every word from the movie as fact. I was pagan before the movie came out. I'd had odd occurrences my entire life, so paganism just felt right. I'm still pagan today, so meeting Chrissy, who talked the talk, was pretty great. She had an apartment with her boyfriend, so it was a perfect place to hang out, talk witchy things, smoke cigarettes, both Herbal and Marlboro, and just exist. We hung out a bunch, and our boyfriends became friends too. My best male friend, we'll call him Billy, he would hang out with us too, and he's also pagan. It wasn't like we were doing spell work together or anything. We just talked, shared herbs, stones, opinions with each other. One night I talked my mum into letting me spend the night at Chrissy's apartment. There were a few of us there. Chrissy, her boyfriend, me and my boyfriend, and our fifth wheel, Billy. The apartment was on the third floor of a pretty sketchy building. I always had an uneasy feeling walking through the door of that building. Billy and I would always make a face at each other. I was super thankful he felt it too. It was in a sketchy area of town. Bars not too far away, known drug activity. But I knew it wasn't that. It was like an odd feeling that just washed over your entire body. Goosebumps on 90 degree days. Almost like you'd walked into a freezer in a restaurant. It was like you had eyes on you. And not just someone watching you. But watching you like you were prey. The sleep overnight was way more intense. Billy... My boyfriend and I were walking up three flights of stairs, my boyfriend ahead of me and Billy behind me, and I got a chill so badly 
my entire body convulsed. Billy asked if I was okay. My boyfriend wasn't really big into this stuff, so I just said I was fine. But Billy knew. He felt it too. We finally get to the door. It felt like it took an hour. We started our night by ordering pizzas, watching garbage movies, laughing and honestly having a great time, to the point I'd totally forgotten about the experience in the stairwell. Then, Chrissy proclaimed that she'd had a child spirit attach itself to her. She'd apparently taken a walk in a cemetery and stumbled upon the gravesite of an entire family. A family she apparently knew the entire backstory of. Which goes that the father, Michael, murdered his wife and three children. But there was no internet or smartphones back then to see if she was telling us a story or not. We kind of had to take her at her word, albeit very sceptically. I'll be totally honest, I bought none of it. Like, if it was law or a town story, we would have all heard the legend. Anyway, as she's telling us this story, she falls over. She was sitting on the floor, so it wasn't like she came crashing to the ground or anything. But apparently, the youngest child of Michael had possessed her. She was acting like a five-year-old child. Honestly, I found it very hard to believe. But whatever, I played along. I'm not going to lie, I was very disappointed. I thought I'd found a cool girl to be friends with. At this point, I sincerely believe Billy and I were the only ones who weren't buying this bullcrap. But I will say this. After that evening, I began having the scariest times of my life. Billy and I never said anything to her. We still hung out with her at school, but very rarely outside of school. One day, Billy and I were driving around, bored, and we wound up by Chrissy's apartment. So I said, do you want to see if Chrissy's home? See if she wants to hang out? Billy said, sure. Again, there's no cell phone, so we couldn't call. And I lead the way up those damn stairs. Honestly, it wasn't even that it was those three flights. At this point, I'm 16 years old. I'm fit. I could do three flights all day long. It was those stairs. They always felt heavy. It was like climbing the Himalayas, not a simple set of stairs. So we get to the top. I knock on the door and no one answers. I tried the knob. Locked. I said, guess they're not home. Billy starts back down the stairs. I hesitated. I thought I heard a voice behind me. I turned to face the door again, and I got smacked in the face with a strong wind. Now there's no windows or another apartment door open, nothing to cause the wind. Billy, thankfully, was already down the three flights picking on me for being a slowpoke. I turned around and said, I I, I thought I heard a voice inside the apartment. I waited a second. And then I was thrown down the stairs, all three flights. Billy stood there in shock as he watched. He knew I didn't just trip and fall. He saw both my feet leave the floor and watched me get thrown down. I got to my feet, and we got the hell out of there. We get into my car, and at first we drove in silence. I chain-smoked like three cigarettes. Finally breaking the silence, I asked if he wanted to stop for a coffee. 
He said, sure, but are we just going to ignore this? You've just been thrown down the stairs and no one was up there. Are you okay? I said, physically, I'm okay. I'm sore. I'm totally going to bruise. But I don't need a doctor or a hospital. I do need a coffee. I just wasn't ready to try and process this out loud yet. I needed more time internally. We got our coffee, we got back in the car, and just drove listening to music for a while. Finally, I said, Listen, I don't care if she was being truthful about that possession, but the thing that threw me was not a child. Billy agreed. He said, I felt it whiz past me when I was going down the stairs. It whizzed past me going up. But I didn't want to make you feel uncomfortable just in case you didn't feel anything. Well, I'm super sarcastic, so I responded with, I think I felt every effing stare, my guy. The warning would have been cool. Billy and I really had to sit down and dig into this. This was not something either of us could just let go. I was pissed. And Billy was very big brother, protective of me. He still is in our forties. As I said, there's no internet or there was no smartphones or anything digitally that could have given us any answers. So we said to hell with it and went to the cemetery where she said she picked up the child's spirit. Now, our hometown is super old. We're sandwiched between forts from the Seven Year War. It's a huge, bloody trail right through and much further north, right through into Canada. So we have very old grave sites and brand new ones. There's a ton of recognised historical buildings. Also with record keeping from so far back, there were floods, fires and random losses. So it's not like the historical society or library were going to do us any good right off the bat. So off to the cemetery we go. And it's huge. It doesn't look like much as you drive by. But there's another one across the street. And that's huge. We looked and we spent hours in both cemeteries. But with only first names to look for and extremely common ones at that, we were not much better off. We were only told that the three names out of a family of five, Michael, the father, Adam, the eldest son, and James, the youngest. And the one who allegedly possessed Chrissy, but they're all super common names, especially if they were war era. We kind of gave up. We get back into the car and Billy said, I honestly believe Chrissy just walked through the cemetery, picking names off stones and made the whole thing up. I said, I don't disagree with you, but there's obviously something, there's some truth to this. Maybe using their names woke them? Now, before anyone assumes anything, This wasn't what Christians perceive as a demon. I know I'll get scoffs, but I don't believe in demons. If you're a piece of crap in life, then you're a piece of crap ghost in death. Ted Bundy isn't going to be Casper, if you get me. This spirit I was dealing with was a human spirit. Billy and I stopped researching and we went on with our teenage lives, until it decided to put a stop to that. My boyfriend and Chrissy's boyfriend became really good friends. He stayed at their apartment one night, and I got a phone call from Chrissy. They'd called an ambulance. My boyfriend had had a really bad asthma attack, and his medicine wasn't working. 
he'd passed out. Chrissy's boyfriend picked me up and took me to the hospital to see him. He was in a rough shape. And when everyone left his room and gave us a minute alone together, he said, Listen, I know this is going to sound crazy, which is why I'm not telling anyone but you. But this asthma attack felt different. I've had asthma my whole life, and I've never had an attack like this. I felt like someone reached inside of me and was squeezing all the air out of my lungs. Neither of my inhalers worked. Black coffee didn't work. All my tricks I've learned and practiced that have worked in the past didn't work this time. It didn't even ease a little bit. It wasn't until I was in the ambulance and we pulled away that I felt better. I hadn't told him about being thrown down the stairs a month or so prior. He didn't believe in this ghosty stuff anyway, so... He was released with no answers and sent home to relax for a few days. When I got home, I walked into the living room to decompress and update my mum on the situation. As soon as I sit down, the phone rang, and it was Billy. WTF is going on. I called earlier because I had a weird feeling, and your mum told me about your boyfriend. So I filled him in, and told Billy what my boyfriend had told me. Billy could not believe what I told him. He was stunned. Maybe a month or so later, I was in the kitchen making food. My mum went out with her friends and I was waiting on the boyfriend to come over. It was just me and my German shepherd mix, Heidi. Like I said, I was in the kitchen cutting up veggies for a salad. I am a little paranoid and I always locked the doors when I was home alone as a teenager. My boyfriend and my mum both had keys, so I wasn't too worried about being locked in. I thought I heard my boyfriend fiddling with his key. Heidi heard it too. She jumped up and stood by the door. So I went to open the door for him, and no one was there. I turned around to go back to the kitchen to finish cutting the veg, and the knife I was using was now sticking out of the kitchen door frame. It was in there pretty deep. It took me a while and an absurd amount of strength to get it out. Shortly after that, the boyfriend walks in, sees I'm kind of shaken and asks what's going on. I told him what had happened. No one else was in the house. The dog obviously didn't do it. I obviously didn't do it. I was at the front door, and why would I stick a knife in a door frame? My mum was already going to be pissed about the hole. How the hell am I going to explain this to my Roman Catholic mother who doesn't believe in ghosts? I was certain she'd have me committed to an asylum. Later, I called Billy and told him what happened. The next day at school... I kind of lost it on Chrissy. I told her her stupid games are having real life consequences. I said, listen, Chrissy, you may have pulled that backstory out of your ass, but ever since your little show, the rest of us that were there have been tormented for months. I think I forgot to add, in between all this craziness, Billy had some pretty crazy health issues. He was hospitalised for a week or more, and they never really figured out what was going on. But they diagnosed him with asthma, which is odd, since my boyfriend was asthmatic, who had the complications due to this spirit. The only ones not suffering were Chrissy and her boyfriend. So I was pissed. What in the living hell was going on? After I yelled at Chrissy, things got weird. Like pounding on my door and no one being there. 
tapping on my windows. My mum and I moved a town over, not due to the goings-on, but she bought a nicer house. The one we were in she was renting. I started to think things were getting better. I still went to the same high school, and I did still chat with Chrissy. She even stopped by to the new house a couple of times. But if we actually hung out together, we would do it in public. I don't know why I felt so bad about just dropping her altogether, especially after she'd stopped over at my new house and weird things started to happen in the new house. It's still just me, my mum and our dog Heidi and our cat Ebony. We would all be in the living room watching TV or whatever and we'd hear what sounded like someone was walking around upstairs. Now, upstairs was just both bedrooms and a full bathroom. At first, we thought it was the cat. She was a little chonk. But she was curled up on a pillow on the couch on the other side of the dog. So we didn't see her at first. Now, I'm six feet tall, with a loud mouth, and when it comes to the possibility of a human being being in the house that's not supposed to be there... I'm not going to send my 5 foot 2, 80 pounds mum up there to fight them. So I go up. Nothing. But in my room, one of my windows was open. I hadn't opened it. I only opened it when I went to bed, as my bed was right under it. Now, I could have believed someone crawled in my window. Had it not been for fact one... There's no way to shimmy up the house to that window on the second story. And fact two, a person can't fit through it. Maybe a toddler, but not a grown person who would be a potential threat. The window doesn't slide like most. It pulls in and opens like a door. I started to think like an animal may have done it. But the screen was intact, and I know I locked it. I told you already I'm kind of paranoid with locking doors, but I'm the same with windows. My dad and a bunch of my family members are in law enforcement, and they kind of instilled in me to lock up tight. So I shut and locked the window, thinking maybe I didn't put the hook latch in the eyelet all the way and the wind popped it open. So I made sure to put the hook all the way on. I went back down again, and the rest of the night went as usual. When I went up to bed, the window was back open again. I couldn't believe it. I know I latched it correctly. But I brushed it off and I went to bed. I hated being alone in this house. I still hate being alone in this house. There's always noises. The animals we had throughout the years acted funny sometimes, but only when I was home alone. Since I was older, my mum could have a full life, so she'd go out with friends. She had to go away for a few days for work. I had a car, school and a job, and she trusted me. I never gave her reason not to. Plus, my aunt wasn't terribly far away. She offered for me to come for dinner or spend the night if I needed, which was super sweet, but I always turned her down. I didn't want to leave our pets alone, only coming in to check on them. They needed their humans too. I had friends who would come and spend the night, the weekend or... Whatever the duration was, my mum was gone. Billy was my number one call, and it would turn into sleepovers with Billy and a few other friends. We never did the party thing, but we'd watch movies, gossip, eat and have a good time. My friends always slept in the living room. We had a pull-out couch or sleeping bags on the floor. None of them would come upstairs after dark. My mum's room was available to us. I had a big room with a big bed, 
even an air mattress. But they refused. Mostly because they could also hear someone walking around upstairs when they fully knew no one was there. I got it. It felt so weird upstairs. Sometimes it still does. My mum still lives there. Billy and I were having some best friend time and I told him that I felt like the spirit that threw me down the stairs had followed us to this house. But I think Chrissy dropped him off. Billy and I started referring to him as Michael since Chrissy gave us that name, so we just used it. We never found any information on the story or the family to confirm or deny. Since this is pretty long already, I'll try and sum up a little better. Billy and I are convinced that Michael still pops up from time to time. Even my now husband, who wasn't around during the height of all this, has experienced him. He saw him outside our living room window when we first started dating. He watched a figure run inhumanely fast across the street and literally bounce off our front door. It was dark outside and we just turned off all the lights. We didn't have drapes up at that moment and we both clearly saw this happen. We didn't realise how fast this thing was running until we went outside, ready to freak out this person, only to find no one there. We were right in the living room. A living person could not have moved that fast. We watched the direction they went and everything. I had my flashlight right by the door, so I grabbed it on the way out, scanning the neighbourhood to no avail. Fast forward about five or six years, my husband and I have two young children and we're having an in-law apartment built onto our home for my father-in-law. I live in a ranch-style house, so open concept. One level, no basement on the main house. Until the addition, we then added a basement, which is mine and the hubby's bedroom. The addition was being added to the back of the house, so just off the kitchen. My husband worked overnight a lot, so after the kids went to bed, I was by myself in the living room, watching TV or listening to music, and weird noises would start coming from the construction area. I'd get nervous that it was the kids messing around. My pitbull slash mastiff mix would accompany me outside to have a look, and... Nothing. But he would have his hackles up. He wouldn't growl or bark, but he was on edge and ready. But these weird noises only seemed to happen during the build. When they were almost done, there was no door between the addition and our house. I put a gate up so my kids and the dogs couldn't get over there. I was listening to music getting stuff done before bed and I heard a growl. I looked at my dogs and they were sleeping and then I realised it had come from the other side of me. Well, I broke out my sage so fast. I saged the hell out of the apartment. A few days later, I worked closing shift at my retail job. My husband was outside when I got home. I thought that was strange, but whatever. He said, you have to do something. There's something in our bedroom. Now my husband isn't religious, but he respects me and mine. I gave him the WTF look. He said, go down there and see. Ugh. It was like what I assume walking into another dimension would feel like. Six hours prior, I was in there getting ready for work and it was fine. But now it felt like another world. So I saged the hell out of it. I did a few other things and it was gone. Well, 
the heavy feeling was gone. The feeling I had during this time, and when the growling was in the addition, I knew without a doubt it was him again. Luckily, he hasn't been able to get in my house again, but every now and again he lingers outside, thumps the windows or the side of the house. The thing that irritates me is because I'm pagan or at the beginning I was a teenager, people think, oh, she used a Ouija board or participated in a seance. Nope, not the case. I truly believe that Chrissy had this attached to her and she knowingly passed it along to us. She wanted it gone, but she didn't know how without pawning it off on someone else. The real crazy stuff is at bay, but he's still definitely around. There are still loud noises when I'm home alone, or banging on the windows. This may sound stupid, but if something really bad happens, I blame his influence. Not for everything, but for some things, like my gut just knows. Then I redo all my protection things and go on about my life. I'm now in my 40s, and I truly believe the goings-on of that one sleepover when I was 15 still affects my life. There's so much more, but I feel utterly long-winded here. Thank you for reading this, and I apologise if it's all over the place. Pixie. Well, thank you so much, Pixie, for that experience. It's very rare we hear anything along the lines of somebody passing on an evil spirit to someone else. And being perfectly honest, I think it could be a first for the show. Now, Pixie has added an addendum to this email. But I'm afraid you're going to have to wait for this week's minisode for me to read that to you. Following Pixie's experience, let's just say it's more of a duty of care, from a podcast host perspective anyway, but all will be revealed on the minisode. So I'll speak to you again on Wednesday for our first minisode of season 15. Until then, stay safe, take care, and remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, Always try and leave some of your disbelief at the door. And I'll speak to you next time, right here on The Dark Paranormal.